Dear Brothers and Sisters in Christ, Today, on the 20th of October, we read in the Synaxarian that the Holy Church commemorates our holy and God-bearing father, Gerasimus, the new ascetic of Peloponnesus, who reposed in peace and whose relics are in Cephalonia. Gerasimus, the radiant and newly appeared star of the Church of Christ, the adamantine stone upon which are shattered the heads of all the innovators and deviators from the infallible tradition of our most holy Orthodox Church, was born in 1509 in the village of Tricala of Corinth in the celebrated Peloponnesus of the illust illustrious Notaras family. His father was named Demetrius, and his mother was Kali. We do not know the saint's baptismal name. The wondrous lad, therefore, was the scion of such parents who, even when his nails were still baby soft, gave him over to the learning of sacred letters. Since he possessed a well-ordered spirit and a disposition for the good, within a few years he advanced considerably in his studies. At that time, the standard curriculum included the Holy Scriptures, the Psalter, and the Octicos. As one possessed of good sense and prudence from his youth, the Holy One gave himself to the study and reading of Holy Scripture, wherein he found lasting and beneficial truths, sufficient to usher joy into his soul. He was made to understand thereby and be fully assured of the deceit and error which are found in worldly and vain studies under the guise of human wisdom. At the same time, he understood well and rightly the emptiness and fickleness of this wily and false world. For these reasons, he turned away from guile and dedicated all his desire and aim to the only summit of good things, to his fashioner, that is, his God. As one sensible, that he might succeed in his goal, he acknowledged as mighty hindrances to himself homeland, family, distinction, wealth, the honor of men, the swelling of lust and the heat of youth, and the violence of the passions. When he attained his majority, with manliness of soul and valor, rare in our times, he turned his back on all these things, wealth, glory, pleasures, parents, kinsfolk, as dung. As a swallow flees the snare, Gerasimus departed his homeland, Tricala, and repaired to the island of Zakynthos. He was about twenty years old when he departed his Turkish-held homeland for the Venetian-controlled island, Zakynthos. Here it appears, Gerasimus became a true imitator of Abraham, who obeyed God when told by him, Go forth from thy land and from thy kindred. In like manner, Gerasimus left his land and kindred in order that he might be able to find with more ease the one whom he solely desired and upon whom all his desire steadily gazed. He recognized that, in order to obtain his desire, it was fit and proper to cast off and set as naught from himself every bodily attachment and complaint which no one manner or another might forcibly draw him away or drag him down into corporeal and earthly endeavors. Thus, such influences could sweep him away or cause trouble and discontent remove him from noetic contemplation, and hinder him from raising the wings of his thoughts to the only Creator God, who dwells not in souls that accept carnal and vain thoughts. Such souls are rendered unworthy of his indwelling grace, 
Nay, he searches for pure vessels and those free from every earthly tie. This is because God fashioned man for himself and granted him all that remains, so that by means of these things man might be able, if he should receive knowledge, to utilize them well and find rest and delight in his Creator, as ought to be the ultimate aim of every man. Having therefore reasoned and recapitulated these things in his mind as an elect vessel, Gerasimus raised his heart and established it firmly after spending a certain time on Zakintos through hardships and asceticism. He was delivered from every troublesome thought of homeland, kinsfolk, wealth, and the remaining host of bodily cares. He began to climb the ladder of the virtues, whose first rung is withdrawal from one's homeland, followed by deliverance from the mightiest ties and causes that attract a man into worldly endeavors and prevent him from abiding from every bodily attachment, so that he might be able always to concentrate his mind on God. When the holy man considered that the snares of the common enemy, the devil, are many and diverse, he placed not trust in himself, but instead desired to find a good guide who would interpret for him the unerring path of virtue, aiming at perfection, toward which he ran forth with all his eager zeal. The Holy Mountain, Athos. Something during the years when the holy man was between twenty-two and twenty-five, sometime, he departed from Zakynthos and went about with longing and spiritual purpose while practicing toils and bodily struggles in various places and villages of Greece. He passed through Thessaly and from there to the Black Sea, to Constantinople, to the Propontus, to Chalcedon, and to the remaining places where he knew men of renown were living in virtue and perfect in ascetic life. They were teachers in practice and experienced in the conduct of life according to God. Having collected from each place an industrious and laborious honeybee, the honey of a God-pleasing conduct of life, he resolved to go to the spiritual and peaceful holy mountain of Athos that he might lead there the monastic life to the benefit of his soul. The saint, therefore, went to the holy mountain with the intent of living the monastic life. Thereupon he dwelt and associated with the fathers in that place. Indeed, he found many laboring faithfully in the mystical vineyard of the Christ, who were competent to guide and teach others also in the unerring path of virtue, and to convey others lovers of virtue into the acquisition of virtuous virtues perfection. The holy Gerasimus also, although a righteous man himself, nonetheless benefited greatly from their company and example, so that divine longing of virtue was inflamed even more in his heart. Even before he received the angelic schema and became a great schema monk, he was enriched with all the virtues, which produce and complete a true monk those virtues being obedience to all the commands of those who shone forth as luminaries in this angelic schema. He, too, mounted the heights of the angelic schema and was made perfect in the great schema. After this, what account can do justice to the struggles, toils, and hardships undergone, which the holy man added to his previous ones, that is, fasts, vigils, tears, prayers, lifting of the mind to God, dedicating himself entirely to God, and estranging himself totally from the world and all the things of the world. Having taken the angelic schema, Gerasimus felt fortified and empowered. He harnessed all his desires and strengths for the bodily and practical virtues mentioned above and cast forth and stood off from every earthly endeavor and concern. 
Next, having been set on wing as another high-flying eagle, he was placing before his mind, mind's eye solely those heavenly good things from which he received both delight and joy in his soul. He lived with, as a flesh-bearing angel, as a heavenly man, and as a treasure house of the divine energies, of grace and gifts of the Holy Spirit, that is to say, of love, meekness, humble-mindedness, peace, sympathy, and the rest. The holy man stood as a solid and unshaken tower in all the attacks and temptations of the invisible enemy, the devil, who observed that this corruptible and earthly man was about to soar and receive the heavenly blessedness, the place and rank from which he himself was hurled down headlong on account of his pride and his haughtiness. While a monk on Athos, Gerasimo's heart burned with the desire to visit Constantinople. He went to the Patriarchate, Hagia Sophia, and other shrines of the Orthodox, which moved him to tears. He then returned to Athos and continued his ascetic struggles. The Holy Land St. Gerasimus spent considerable time on that hallowed mountain, Athos. He verily became an elect vessel of divine grace and a perfect prototype of the life and conduct according to Christ, being wholly aflame from divine love. He was not, however, satisfied solely from noetic meditation of his beloved Jesus Christ, but resolved to see and refresh himself by venerating those holy places of Jerusalem, where verily the great mystery of the redemption of the race of man was energized on account of the economy of the incarnation of the Son and Logos of God. Therefore, he made a good voyage to the Holy Land. The reader may imagine how much reverence and yearning the saint possessed while venerating and receiving spiritual benefit at these sites. Indeed, one can understand how much spiritual good, cheer, and gladness filled the holy man's soul when he was able to apprehend, by sight and touch, the actual places at which the love of his soul, Jesus Christ, condescended to be born in the flesh, to be reared, to suffer the passion and be crucified, to rise from the dead, and to accomplish the rest of the supernatural and awesome mysteries of the economy of his incarnation. In that place, filled with insatiable eagerness and divine love, the... The true lover of virtue, Gerasimus, went to Mount Sinai, where those God-pleasing events were wrought, as narrated in the Holy Scripture. He then went on to Antioch and Damascus, followed by all of Egypt and Libya. He was also encompassed most, or in general, all of Anatolia. Everywhere he was seeking and collecting the flowers of virtue, deeming himself imperfect and an inexperienced beginner. Let it not seem unusual to anyone that our righteous father, Gerasimus, went about and traveled from place to place as his history reveals. It was not possible, says the author, that such a God-bearing and divinely inspired man who unceasingly and noetically was saying with David, Thy law is a lamp to my feet and a light to my paths, should go about as one led astray or unstable. Nay, he walked according to the divine nod and beckoning by God's determination and counsel. Indeed, from others he was being benefited, developed, and improved in the perfection of virtue. Indeed, the blessed man himself was benefiting others 
and putting them on the paths of virtue, even as other saints of our church went about so as to see and learn many and varied monastic and eremitical conducts of life, that they might acquire exactly and fully perfection in the monastic life. After, therefore, such a laborious journey, in accordance with those times wherein he bore spiritual fruit, the holy man returned again to Jerusalem, being aflame always with love for his most sweet Jesus Christ, and wishing to have perpetual and perceptible reason as an unceasing remembrance for him of his beloved master, that he might delight noetically and apprehend him who was the only object of his desire and yearnings. He wished to serve in the life-giving and life-deriving tomb of our Lord as a lamplighter for an entire year. Since the Turks were in control of the area at that time, the Holy Sepulchre was locked up every night by them. St. Gerasimo spent much time alone at night in that blessed precinct. Then, after these experiences, as one fit furnished and accomplished in virtue, the divine Gerasimus not only was sanctified by divine grace and the famed angelic schema, but also shone forth in a befitting manner by the Holy Spirit with the lofty and precious mark of the priesthood as an experiential vessel for such an awesome and heavenly service, as an exceptional vessel for such an awesome and heavenly service. Thus, he might offer to God quickly and closely the bloodless sacrifice and his fervent prayers, sacrificing purely and worthily that which, on account of his love, he condescended to sacrifice for his creature so that he might have life and salvation. Father Gerasimus, having already attained 30 years of age, was canonically ordained by the most blessed then patriarch Germanos of Jerusalem. The holy man stayed with the patriarch for 12 whole years, serving with proper fervor and becoming virtue with proficiency and self-surrender. Upon receiving the dignity of the priesthood, the holy man added toils and hardship to his austerities, for he was disposed in his heart to increase his struggles as much as he was able, that he might attain safely and successfully the calm harbor of dispassion, which all those who watch and labor gaze longingly upon, upon from their youth for he knew that such an attainment was a foretaste in this corruptible and temporal life of that ineffable and unspeakable joy which is prepared for all men, all true workers of virtue, and for those who serve faithfully and humbly in the mystical vineyard of Christ from the first hour of the day without bearing malice toward those who come after. Thus, the saint conducted his life, as he struggled resolutely in all things, following the divine apostle Paul, who wrote to the Philippians, Brethren, I, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forth to those things which are before, I pursue toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He did not consider his past toils and hardships for virtue, but instead knew that all those who run in the stadium in order to arrive at the goal and receive the prize do not look at the course behind them to see how far they have run, but ever view and contemplate what is before them, and their eagerness heightens as they perceive that the prize lies closer to them. At length, the Holy Gerasimus desired to go from Jerusalem to the Jordan River, that he might offer veneration in that place. Thereupon, with the leave of the patriarch, who was his elder, he went and spent a sufficient number of days in that place. He searched out and enjoyed those God-bearing fathers 
that lived in the environs upon about the Jordan, where so many of them were struggling and shining forth, professing perfectly an ascetical conduct of life that was equal to that of the angels. The blessed Gerasimus received a blessing from the patriarch that he might spend some time at the very place where our Lord Jesus went into the wilderness, fasted forty days and nights, and was tempted by the devil. In that place the blessed Gerasimus was vouchsafed even as were certain other saints, that gift and grace from God of fasting forty days, that he that that is he was able to abide without food and drink for forty whole days and nights. He also endured the demon's blasphemous and insults in that place. Thus, our Gerasimus revealed to be a wondrous and most perfect prototype of the life according to Christ and a suitable dwelling place of divine grace, that he too might be shown as a luminary of the church. For Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and to the ages. In addition, he was proof that divine grace, both now and ever, is given to all those who seek after it with sincere faith, guilelessness, and a humble spirit, even as it is fitting, and who faithfully follow the commandments of God. For hearken to the unerring promise uttered by the Lord who said, Behold, I am with you all the days until the completion of the age. The fault lies then not with the seasons or ages or generations. It in which we live, but instead with our bad motives, principles, and inclinations, together with our inadequate faith and ignorance of him. This is on account of our preference for the corruptible and temporal and deceptive good things of this world over that which is incorruptible and eternal because we are altogether riveted to these things which only goad our senses, but those things which are heavenly, noetic, and eternal, we do not bring to remembrance at all. How then shall we imagine that in such souls and hearts the divine grace can dwell? For even as God spoke to Noah, my spirit shall not dwell in these men unto the ages because they have become altogether flesh. Also, whosoever divine grace is not found, verily also virtue cannot be achieved, even as the Lord himself said, Apart from me ye are not able to do anything. But this blessed man sought out God with all the desire and ardor of his soul, and also fulfilled his divine will without hesitation and constantly. With the humility of soul and heart that is true and proper for one who is a creature, he sought after divine grace, and for this he was deemed worthy to be glorified by him. He was also vouchsafed splendid gifts and energies of grace from God. St. Gerasimus was confirming the unerring promise of the Master Christ, who said, The one who believeth in me, the works which I do shall that one do also, and greater works than these shall he do. After his sojourn by the Jordan, the Divine Father returned to Jerusalem as a flesh-bearing angel and heavenly man. Then, by and by, certainly being moved by indwelling divine grace, which, according to the command of the Lord, Father Gerasimus was to be granted as a heavenly gift and inviolate treasure for the island of Cephalonia, the holy man asks the patriarch, the, sorry, the holy man asked the most blessed patriarch Germanos, his elder, for permission to leave, 
The patriarch knew perfectly and was mindful of the degree of virtue and sanctity of the holy Gerasimus. He was fully assured of the wisdom of God's decision, because all of his disciples' movements and endeavors had in view God, by whom he was governed. Patriarch Germanus gave Father Gerasimus the freedom and permission to go wherever divine grace guided and appointed him, that he might benefit others. Crete From Jerusalem, then, the righteous man passed over in 1548 to Cyprus and then to Crete, which was occupied by the Latins with the help of the Venetians. The Orthodox were persecuted and being driven out. Through his presence, St. Gerasimus was emboldened and offering comfort to the Orthodox through his preaching and his life of prayer. To this day, the cave where he spent a little time is visible. The pious Orthodox have since built a little church there in honor of St. Gerasimus. Another cave on the island is also preserved as a shrine where the saint spent time. In the neighborhood of Vresus Modia Kedonia, the tradition is that the saint tarried in this area longer. It is a large cave, about 15 meters by 15 meters, at the village of Provolia Henion in the section of Fuscide. Fuscidi. In that cave, the saint both lived and taught. Many Christians went to the saint there in order to find peace for their souls and strength in their faith. It seems that God worked through this saint by sending him to places where Christians needed strengthening. Sequintos. Having rested there a short while, he returned after being gone for twenty years to Zakynthos. The year was 1550, when he ascended the mountains on that island, which are situated on the western coast, and he found a cave near the sea, which was pre precipitous, a precipitous place and difficult to traverse. He inhabited that place for five years, pursuing eagerly the ascetic life and never shrinking from work. He conversed noetically and solely with God, who was found there with him. The difficult terrain and the harshness of that place, which to this day bears the name of the saint, is such that the sight alone, without explanation, effectively gives all to comprehend the superhuman life, equal to that of the angels that the righteous man conducted. For the duration of those five years which he passed as a cave dweller, his food was nothing more than a little boiled squash without salt and legumes having been soaked in water. He passed through such austerities that he resembled certain chosen saints of times long ago, long gone. Indeed, he was like unto our holy father Theodosius the Cenobiarch, who did not eat bread for thirty whole years. Father Gerasimus also maintained his strict regime both before and after his building of a monastery in Cephalonia. But let us not more ahead of ourselves, but let us not now move but let us not move ahead of ourselves in relating his story. Oh, the conjecture and astonishment raised among the islanders on account of the saint's angelic life and fame. How much spiritual good cheer and benefit to the souls of many did he afford. St. Gerasimus, as an august vessel of the Holy Spirit and pure dwelling place of divine grace, had virtue as an inseparable companion. Now well rooted in his soul was the elevation of humility, which is the sole and true guardian of virtue, and this only is capable of bringing the creature to his creator. For this, the saint, knowing the manifold snares of the devil and wishing to avoid the notions of pride and conceit, decided to depart from that place also. We indeed 
Blessed Christians, most certainly ought to marvel at the providence of God and at the same time offer due glory and thanks for his compassion and sympathy toward us. For he had appointed and sent to Caphalonia such a divinely inspired and God-bearing man that he might enrich the island with the grace of his virtues and the gifts and of his wonders. The island also would obtain a compassionate protector and mediator. Cephalonia. The saint therefore departed from Zakynthos in 1554 and finally came to the island of Cephalonia, on which it was the good pleasure of the all-good God to implant and deposit as a treasure perpetually a guardian, protector, and ready helper. At that time the Venetians ruled over the freedom-loving Cephalonians. The Papists, and in particular the Jesuits, were zealous in their proselytizing. Their designs came to naught. Though the Latin tactics of the Orthodox and the Orthodox struggles could fill many pages, Father Gerasimus chose this island as his dwelling place. Or should we say that this is where God sent his angel? Our Holy Father found himself a small cave about the village of Argostoli, which was commonly called Spilia, even as the neighboring village is now called. At Spelia, the saint dwelt eleven months. The cave remains to this day and still preserves the signs of the saint's occupancy. The Christians later, to the glory of the saint and from their reverence toward him, founded a chapel in the northern part of the cave where his bedspread appears. Though extremely old on the stone, there are... <coughs> There are also other signs of his residency. At that chapel and the cave, a considerable number of Christians, both men and women, gather and celebrate the feast of the saint twice a year. Also, from time to time, various Christians, both natives and strangers, venerate the place on pilgrimage. Thus, in the minds of many, St. Gerasimus' name and memory abide firm and alive in that cave. Since the place is situated near Argostoli, with a view of the open sea, and the saint's wondrous and superhuman life of virtue was not able to remain hidden, his fame spread abroad speedily, so that many men and women hastened to him. The saint perceived that it was impossible to enjoy in that place his desired silence and to be found with his long longed for christ his only desire was to hold converse with him only and to main that spiritual joy and good cheer in his soul for that ineffable gladness was a foretaste of that super supra mundane and everlasting kingdom of the heavens he decided, therefore, to decamp from that place and to find a quiet and untroubled spot where he might achieve his aim. The Lord, who does the will of those who fear him, dispensed in his economy to fulfill the saints' godly desires. Hearken to the manner in which the holy man was conveyed to the neighborhood of Omala, at Omala, Cephalonia. According to ancient tradition, which is firm and beyond doubt, having been bequeathed to us by our forefathers, the place where the monastery of St. Gerasimus is located at Omala was then wild and uncultivated. It is at the foot of a mountain called Anus. The entire topography and land around it was covered with forests. On the opposite side and higher up, was the village named Valsamata, which to this day remains that name. At that village there was a priest monk named George, who was native-born. He had two virgin sisters who were living as nuns. Higher monk George also serviced a church in the upper village, where he and his sisters worked for God. In that place, the present-day Monastery of the Saint, 
as we mentioned, appears clearly. It happened one night while Hiram Monk George was going to church for the service of Orthros that he observed a light in the forest. After the first and second appearance of the light, he gave no heed to it, but after he had seen it many times, he compelled by curiosity decided to go and investigate the phenomenon during the daylight. On exploring the site, Higher Monk George found hidden a certain icon of our most holy lady Theotokos. After the discovery of that icon, Higher Monk George built, as well as he was able, a small church in which he himself would serve on that spot where he found the icon. The priest's two sisters also came down from the village of Alsamada, and they lived the ascetical life in that little church. Now, neither these blessed women nor anyone else perceived that what took place was supernatural and a miracle of divine grace, which foretold and prepared the place for the coming of Gerasimus, the foreordained protector of the island of Cephalonia. It would also be there that St. Gerasimus would cease his foreign travels and fulfill the days of his earthly sojourn. From this place the holy Gerasimus would take wing and go to his most beloved and sweetest Jesus Christ and find the everlasting rest of the kingdom of heavens. This is what he desired from his youth and that for which he valiantly and steadfastly gave himself over to pains and toils in this corruptible and temporal life. It was this place where divine providence and goodness would deposit, as an inviolate and inexhaustible treasure, his holy relics for the sincere who hastened to him with faith. The saint's holy monastery today the saint's holy monastery church in honor of the Domitian of the Theotokos is located here today together with the tomb of the saint above which are enshrined in it in the reliquary his holy wonder-working and incorrupt relics in a reliquary. The report therefore of the aforementioned holy icon spread throughout the island. Therefore, many from all parts of the island hastened to visit the icon and had been that had been revealed in a mystical manner. Some indeed were moved by curiosity, but others came out of piety and to offer veneration. The righteous Gerasimus, living as an ascetic in that cave, also received the report of what had occurred. He, for a surety, was moved by the divine grace in dwelling in him that ever guided his movements. He decided to go and see for himself if he could find a quiet and untroubled spot in accordance with his desire that he might worship God alone. This is because at Spelia, where he was staying, after much scrutiny, he could not find quiet in that place since it was neighboring the village. When St. Gerasimus arrived at the place where the holy icon was discovered, the aforementioned sisters of Father George straightway understood, from beholding his angelic and august countenance, his venerable appearance, and mellifluous, mellifluous words, that he was a God-bearing man and vessel of divine grace. Therefore, with all the yearning and effervescence of their souls, they were talking to the holy stranger, saying, Come, slave of God, and live the monastic life in this place. We shall have thee as our spiritual father, and submit as the most submissive children to thee until the end of our lives. In this manner we, the wretched ones, on the one hand, shall be guided by means of thee, that we might find the unerring path of salvation, and thou, on the other hand, mayest enjoy thy much-desired quiet. The saint said to the nuns, And how shall I come? It is perhaps that your brother, the higher monk, wishes me to come? They said, He does wish thee to come, and wishes thee to abide satisfied and content here. The saint said to them, 
If in truth thy brother wants me, let him confirm it in writing, and then shall I come here to dwell and cultivate the place as well as I am able. The sisters then eagerly revealed the holy Gerasimus' objective to their brother, Hiram Monk George. They, being very excited at the prospect, enthusiastically urged him to decline his claim to the property in writing and to transfer in writing the thicket to Father Gerasimus the stranger. Thus, the land transfer was worded and written and attested to by witnesses and dated the 1st of September, 1561. The brief document is preserved in the monastery register. Thus, Father Gerasimus would be able to possess the land and have authority over it, cultivating it as it seemed best to him. He was also empowered to dispose of it as it pleased him in the event of his repose. The Saint Begins Cultivation when the holy Gerasimus took up residence in that place, he began to clear it and plant trees, olives, and vineyards up to the property boundary, the end of the field of Hiramunk George. With his own hands, Gerasimus dug, according to firm tradition, the well which is found there to this present day, bearing his name. Now, throughout the entire neighborhood of Amala, there is not to be found an active well that gushes water within any degree of abundance. In fact, the topography of the region does not allow for it. St. Gerasimus' well, however, is never without water. In times of drought, when there is a dearth of water in other parts of Omala, the saint's well supplies water for that region to both people and their livestock. This has occurred not a few times. Indeed, all confess this manifestation with a common voice. At this well, there occurs yet another wonder which goes beyond every known natural law. This occurrence we have seen with our own eyes. Many other eyewitnesses confess it openly and are in accord. The phenomenon occurs while the priests are bearing aloft the reliquary during the procession and entreaty that is made for the saints' two feast days. At that point, when they recite the customary prayer and set down the reliquary, the water in the well then ascends to the lip. When they take up the holy relics from the place, the water descends to its customary level. Many, however, anticipating beforehand this phenomenon, draw out the water with a bucket, or with their hands, or by soaking their handkerchiefs. Thus, many have personally experienced this marvel, but it does not always occur. As a result, there are many who disbelieve. Each of them says, How is it that I did not see it? Whereas I went near the well during that time in the procession, where the saint's relics are set down upon the well. Someone might well answer, on account of the disbelief of some, even as thou hast, and because others pose futile and useless questioning of the things of the faith or divine providence, for reasons known to God alone, he does not permit this miracle to take place at every procession. Now, just because thou sawest it not, nor those like thee, this is hardly proof that the phenomenon does not take place. Let none enter tempting the spotless faith, as spoken by the divine Chrysostom. We converse with the faithful and follow the saying of the heavenly Paul, a heretical man, after a first and second admonition, by rejecting, knowing that such a one hath been perverted and sinneth, being self-condemned. Now, since Gerasimus began in such a manner, and made progress in the cultivation of that wild and fruitless region, the hater of the good, the devil, through what he saw, feared the outcome. For the place, by means of the saint, in but a short time, was about to become a hallowed and under divine protection, and a place where the Most High would be worthily and continually glorified. The enemy further conjectured the God-pleasing precinct would bring many souls to salvation. Hence, he gnashed his teeth against the saint. But, since he was not able to trouble St. Gerasimus directly, 
because the God-pleasing life and conduct of the saint rendered him full of divine grace and an animate vessel of the Holy Spirit, the devil sowed car carnal, I think it says carnal, and jealous anger in higher monk George. When the priest monk beheld the property cultivated and bearing fruit, he repented that he had granted it to the holy stranger. Other villagers and neighbors provoked and stirred up the anger of the priest monk, surely from the devil acting as accomplice, that he might hinder the future spiritual good and grieve the saint. Therefore, all the neighbors, and especially higher monk George, instigated many temptations and troubles against the holy man. The blessed Gerasimus, however, as one experienced in the machinations of the devil, knew that all these things were advanced by the cooperation and instigation of the hater of good in order to prevent the potential spiritual good which he saw was about to be accomplished successfully. The saint was not agitated in the least, nor did he neglect this God-pleasing labor, but noetically he kept praying to God. Thou, O Lord, who hast directed me and guided me to this place, if my labor is pleasing to thee, thou knowest and art able to scatter every contrivance of the hater of good, and show to the end thy favor to this labor of mine, if it is to thine almighty glory and praise, and to the spiritual benefit of my neighbor. Thus the saint resumed his labor with meekness and quietness in his soul, being altogether dedicated to God, who knows all things and can bring them to altogether dedicated and can bring them to pass. The saint, therefore, overcame the tempter. Higher monk George and the Higher Monk George and the rest of the villagers came to perceive the sanctity of the and the of the righteous man and the indwelling of the grace of God in him. They therefore not only ceased bothering him, but also left him to abide in quiet, giving him control of that property. Furthermore, they fell before his feet, weeping and fervently asking forgiveness for their error. Each of them also steadfastly promised he would help him according to his ability in the God-pleasing work that Father Gerasimus undertook. The saint, with Christ-like meekness and forbearance, raised them up with great cheerfulness and spiritual joy, and he blessed them. He then admonished them in those things needful and dismissed them in peace. After these events, the great man of virtue and noted achievements, with his hardy training and persistent asceticism, utterly withered the sensibilities of the flesh and deadened the passions. He adorned his soul with flowers of the virtues and was made bright with the comeliness of divine grace. He then put on the radiant raiment of dispassion and attained spiritual discernment, guided by humility, the only safe preserver of virtue. Certainly, in order that he might arrive in the calm and untroubled harbor of dispassion, he endured by the grace of God many temptations. On account of his profound love for God and all creation, he recognized no difference between himself and the stranger, the faithful and unfaithful, the slave and the free, male and female, even as did our God-bearing Maximus the Confessor, who said that for the one coming to perfection in love and the summit of dispassion, he considered no difference between himself and another, the faithful and the unfaithful, the slave and the free of men and women altogether. But above the tyranny of the passions, he came to look upon the nature of man as one, considering all equally and well disposed to all equally, even as St. Saint Paul, who says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, male and female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. 
the building of the new Jerusalem, Cenobium of the Domitian. Since the saint arrived at such a degree of sanctity, divine grace gave him to understand that, through means of him, others also were to be benefited. For as a good merchant or trader or faithful steward, he wished to increase the talent entrusted to him by the Master Christ, even as the servant who received five. He was persuaded that the concealed mystery and will of divine providence was being revealed to him, so he set about the remodeling of the monastery to the glory and praise of God and for the spiritual bearing of fruit and benefit of many souls. He made new from the very beginning the small church which was founded there by higher monk George. St. Gerasimus built up from the foundations the church in its present day form, dedicating it to the Domitian of Our Lady Theotokos. After this project, he constructed various cells and a fence around the place. Thus he made a complete monastery, furnishing all the needful bodily comforts, and then named the holy place New Jerusalem. For he was mindful that we have no abiding city here, but we seek the coming one. That is the upper Jerusalem, which is described by St. John, who says, the holy Jerusalem, having the glory of God. The gates of the monastery officially opened in 1561. Father Gerasimus received the blessing and permission of the Bishop of Cephalonia, Pacomus, Pacomius Macris. Before his repose, Father Gerasimus also requested that the monastery be made a patriarchal Stavropigian, so that it might be protected from any designs of the Papists and Venetians. As a result, the saint obtained, albeit after his repose, two sigilia, that is, documents bearing the patriarchal seal, which are still preserved at the monastery. The first Sigilian from Patriarch Jeremius confirms that the founder, the priest Gerasimus of the convent at Omala, named New Jerusalem, is a patriarchal Stavropigion. The second Sigilian from Patriarch Kirill V also confirms the convent's status. The convent thus became the beacon of the island. The saint, till the end, maintained his ascetical struggles. His diet consisted of a gourd without salt, which he ate half of the week. The remainder of the week he partook of soaked legumes without bread. He took very little sleep, and when he did recline, it was on a rock. He also worked with his hands, since he was a man used to inhabiting caves and the holes of the earth. So was his ascetical retreat at the monastery. One opening on the west side of the church with a stair leading down to a dark basement which was built under the monastery courtyard led to his apartment of two rooms. It resembled a tomb, perhaps so that he might be kept the remembrance of death. In this retreat, his gift of tears poured forth for his own weaknesses and those of the Christian brethren threatened by apostasy. Since all the while such virtue as that of the holy Gerasimus could not remain hidden much longer, his good name spread throughout the island. Daily, people of every age, background, and situation were hastening to him, and as an imitator of Christ, he received everyone. Each departed with benefit to his soul and spiritual rejoicing, which he received from Father Gerasimus' angelic appearance and his mellifluous teaching, and also his heavenly conduct of life. At that time in Greece, which was under Ottoman or Venetian authority, the priest of a parish very often was the schoolteacher. 
Father Gerasimus taught all the pilgrims and those regularly coming to church the correct knowledge and interpretation of the scriptures. He was also then enjoined to teach the children Greek letters, reading and writing. This then became the customary work of the monastics of Cephalonia, since no other schooling was available. The saint thus was a great benefactor to the education of children. His curriculum consisted of the books of the church, including the Octiochus, the Psalter, and especially the Gospels. The saint proved himself a very skillful grammar teacher, but he also taught basic math and history. He taught them for two or three hours. Afterward, the nuns would treat the children to some cheese and then dismiss them to their homes. In future documents, men who held offices and positions on the island would sign their names, adding a pupil of the saint. Another tradition on the island maintains that the saint went about preaching the Orthodox faith from village to village in order to preserve the people from the papal preaching. Thus, as an intimate of the Trinity and a laborer for the gospel, he sowed seeds that perpetuated the true faith among the islanders. Being constrained, he then submitted to the eagerness and desire of those who hastened to him and besought him warmly to enter monasticism. Together with the two sisters of Hiram Monk George, he received other women, and the number at the monastery came to twenty-five nuns. The nuns rejoiced spiritually and offered thanksgiving with all their souls, for divine compassion providentially gave them such a spiritual father, who was a practical and effective teacher of the life according to Christ and the perfection of the monastic profession. The righteous man, therefore, ceased not keeping a watchful eye on his rational flock and the divine providence entrusted to him. He taught them daily. At times he would explain and instruct them how to guard themselves and how to recognize and flee the villainies and deceits of the common enemy, the devil, who had even greater malice toward them, seeing they had the angelic schema. If they maintained what was due and performed their duty, they would become inheritors of those eternal things which, from which Satan fell down headlong on account of his pride. At other times the saint would show them the true path, which was able to convey them to paradise. He exhorted them, saying that in order to win this, they should resolve to dismiss, dismiss every vain and corruptible thing deeming good by this deceitful world. Thus they might enter the sweet and light yoke of the Christ, the true bridegroom of souls. Then he discoursed upon the decrees of virtue and how true laborers of virtue progress gradually yet this cannot be attained except with love that is sincere love for god and neighbor with meekness of spirit and bodily toils these are the means by which we may obtain the spiritual virtues he was teaching these things day by day to his spiritual children but more so was the saint instructing them by his own active example, by his angelic life and conduct, which is the teaching in truth. This has more power to incite the onlooker toward virtue, which is not the case for one who only hears. For we deem our eyes most trustworthy than our ears." The heavenly conduct of life of this divine father vouchsafed him to possess great boldness before God and to receive the grace of the working of wonders. He especially became an inexhaustible fount of healings of all kinds and a helper in affliction and a fervent intercessor to those who called upon him ardently and to those who hastened to him with sincere faith even as from the new indispensable accounts we must narrate. Thus, the Christians and those born after us shall not be deprived of this knowledge. The saint helps his neighbors. 
At that time, when the saint was still among the living, the island of Caphalonia experienced a great drought. In those times, this was the cause of widespread destruction, because there were few vineyards and grapes, and nearly all the income of the island was involved in various types of crops from their fields sown with cereals. The inhabitants, seeing the calamity threatening them, hastened to God and conducted entreaties and processions. Yet time was passing, and the evil threatened utterly to destroy the crops. Then the extreme compassion of God gave the divine nod both to cure the great calamity and to reveal the virtue and boldness which the divine Gerasimus, with his faithful labors, attained before him. With one voice, all cried aloud that if they did not hasten to the righteous Gerasimus, and if he did not supplicate God, there would be no remedy to this trouble. They were running, therefore, as though they were one, from different parts of the island to the righteous man, whom they deemed the only hope left to them, that he might deliver them. As they brought tidings of the misfortune, they stood before him with tears, reporting crop damage. They fervently besought him not to abandon them, but to mediate on their behalf with God, who is able to cure that formidable plague. The saint received them with joy. He grieved truly in his soul and understood himself, too, the burden of the calamity. When they constrained him with their request, his burden, uh, his extreme humility forced him to draw back and dismiss himself. He called himself a sinner and unworthy to be bold before God and request such a gift of grace. He knew, according to the divine Maximus, it is no small struggle to release oneself of vainglory. Nonetheless, the holy man's self-deprecation and humility heighten their fervor and hopes that we might be brief here. The holy man finally resigned himself. He went to his knees weeping, beseeching with faith and further the fat fervor, the fashioner to have mercy on his creation. He begged the Heavenly Father to overlook the faults of his children. He implored God, who is rich in gifts, to open the fount of his gifts and have mercy on his people. Verily, God hearkened to the prayer of his slave when he received the perfect end to his request. St. Gerasimus' boldness before God was manifest and not to be doubted. The proof lay before all. The thirsty earth drank to satiety. The crops revived. The grieving people were consoled. They glorified the compassion of God with all their souls and rendered thanks to the holy man, as was meet. Each then returned to his own home rejoicing, proclaiming with a great voice the sanctity and boldness of the saint before God. Such then was the saint's heavenly conduct of life. He showed himself to be an unmercenary physician to the sick, and a wise healer and teacher to as many as were suffering from bodily infirmities, or calamities, and worldly afflictions, or sins and passions of the soul. All those who hastened to him departed cured and consoled. Assuredly, it was manifest that divine compassion sent the holy man to the island of Cephalonia as a heavenly gift and treasury of benefactions of God's mercy, mercies. St. Gerasimus especially received great authority against the demons, whom he invisibly scourged when he was alive, but he also continues to do so even after his repose, and wondrously cast them out of the possessed. The Saint's Repose Yet the time arrived for the righteous man to leave this temporal life and pass over to the everlasting and boundless one, so that he might receive more purely and closely, closely him whom he solely loved and yearned for with his entire soul from his youth. 
that he might attain to his this desire, we know that he struggled patiently, resolutely, and constantly, showing so much manfulness in all his battles and adversities with those three savage and cruel enemies of man, that is, the flesh, the world, and the devil. In a time bereft of examples of a life equal to the angels and superhuman, this holy man was found worthy of it. He received grace and power from God that enabled him to attain the divine energies and the gifts of God, even as other notable and wondrous saints of our Orthodox Church. St. Gerasimus was 70 years old and perhaps a little more when he received the divine revelation that the time of his departure had arrived. Therefore, with humility and gratitude, he gave thanks to his Creator, for he vouchsafed him through his grace to pass through the time of this fleeting life in accordance with his divine will. With his customary meekness and cheerfulness as a tender and loving father and a faithful and good shepherd, he cried out for his much-desired spiritual children. He gathered together Father Ionikios and Father Germanus, who served the convent with him, together with Abbess Laurentia and all the sisterhood. He revealed to the nuns that the time of his departure had arrived. He asked them to neither be troubled nor grieved at such a message, but much rather to rejoice, for he would be better able to visit and provide for the nuns. He made this declaration and then said it would be so, since he would be standing closer to his creator and fashioner God in his heavenly kingdom. He prophesied that he would be better able to do this there than if he tarried with them here below on the earth. Afterward, he exhorted them to always keep well in remembrance the promises which they gave to their heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ, when they put on the angelic schema. He admonished them to strip themselves of every relationship and possession and passionate attachment to this corruptible and vain world. He urged them to cleave only to their desire for him and to keep unperverted and unshaken their rule and mode of monastic life which Gerasimus handed down to them. He also advised them to keep above all else love and oneness of mind among themselves. He warned them to have in remembrance and to have before their eyes always utter humility, long-suffering, and the forbearance of their heavenly bridegroom Jesus Christ, who, being God, humbled himself for the love and compassion he had toward his creature for whose sake he condescended to endure such an ignominious and torturous death. He counseled them to consider themselves sinners, even to their last breath, and always to call themselves unworthy slaves of Jesus, their bridegroom. Finally, if divine grace should deem them worthy to achieve some God-pleasing work of virtue, they should attribute it all to the grace of God and his compassion which gave them the strength and ability to accomplish it and not ever attribute it to themselves. This is because what is good together with the virtues goes forth from God. These things are granted freely from God alone, even as he himself uttered, Apart from me ye are not able to do anything. After the holy man comforted his spiritual children with these and other spiritual counsels, he confirmed and blessed the nuns. Then cheerfully and joyfully he, rescinded his, he surrendered his blessed soul into the hands of his maker and fashioner, whom he loved from his earliest youth and for whom he labored, labored faithfully and continually, so that he was deemed worthy to hear that desired voice. Well done, O good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. His final words were, Lord Jesus Christ, Son and Logos of 
God, have mercy on me and receive my soul. Of the seventy years and then some which he spent in this corruptible life, nineteen were spent dwelling in his venerable monastery, which he raised and set up as a paternal inheritance for his spiritual children, and which would live down through the years, even as his testament reveals in detail. His blessed falling asleep took place in the year in the fifth in the 1579th year after the dispensation of the incarnation on the 15th of august fathers ionikios who now served as spiritual father and germanos then garbed the saints relic sacred relics in his best vex vestments on account of the saints great love for the theotokos he had once expressed his desire to repose on the day of her falling asleep. He was left unburied for five, five days so that people from all over the island might be conveyed to his monastery. At his funeral, a very compunctious service was held with Bishop Philotheos Lovrodos officiating with the priests of Caphalonia. Due to time constraints, I will uh, stop stop there. But the account in the Cynic Syrian uh, of the life continues with the translation of the saint's relics, miracles of the saint, uh, including a woman suffering violent demonic possession, uh, miracle at the plague of 1760, the healing of an epileptic in 1780, the case of the stolen sheep in 1781, the healing of a deaf, dumb, and mute woman in 1785, the healing of a demonized woman in 1786, the healing of a gravely ill woman from Lefkada in 1788, the healing from smallpox and blindness in 1790, the healing of an epileptic in 1793, the healing of a demoniac from Masolongi, the healing of a demoniac from Valsamada in 1796, um, an account where the saint helps those on rough seas in 1807, the healing of demoniacs in 1923, um, and so forth. Through the prayers of St. Gerasimus, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.